Do you want to know the High Republic's greatest achievement when it comes to storytelling? This initiative has excelled in so many areas of Star Wars lore, but this era's greatest triumph is making all of us seemingly forget that there has to be two Sith Lords out in the galaxy plotting, training, and delicately shifting pieces around on the galactic board to eventually make way for their ascension. Think about what Mon Mothma said in Andor. I show you the stone in my hand, you miss the knife at your throat. Now this theory will hurt, it'll likely make you mad, it will definitely come as a shock to you, but it's absolutely 100% necessary in making this time period flow seamlessly into the prequel era with ideals alone. I have an idea about how I think this era of storytelling is going to end and how the Sith have positioned these domino pieces to mark the beginning of the end for the Jedi and the Republic. If you haven't been reading the High Republic series, no sweat, I'm going to catch you up to speed. This is the golden era of the Republic and their partnership with the Jedi Order. Occurring around 250 to 350 years before the Skywalker Saga, the Republic is expanding their galactic reach into the frontier, or as we know it, the Outer Rim. To maintain a presence and influence into the newly explored frontier, two things are happening. First, the Jedi are building temples on these worlds and acting as marshals, basically patrolling and keeping the peace in their designated systems and sectors. Second, the Supreme Chancellor Lena So has constructed Starlight Beacon, a mobile Republic hub that provides aid, security, and diplomatic help across the Outer Rim. Things are going great at first, but a vile, nasty group of marauding pirates known as the Nile aren't too happy that galactic law and order is pushing its way into their territory. Kinda makes it hard to pillage and plunder if the Jedi take offense to your way of life. In response, the Nile cause a hyperspace disaster that nearly destroys several systems, they attack the Republic during a unity fair, and they bring down Lena So's crowning achievement in a burning heat, the Starlight Beacon. Phase 1 ends with the Niles, now publicly affirmed leader, Markeon Rowe, establishing an occlusion zone with boundaries meant to keep the Republic and the Jedi out of their claimed space. Not only leaving the Nile to do what they do best without the fear of Republic justice, but dealing the Jedi and the Republic an embarrassing and devastating loss. The Nile are so dangerous not only because of their lack of moral code, but because of their mysterious ability to travel through hyperspace off of the mapped path. I would have to say though that the true genius of the Nile is their confusing chain of command. It keeps the Jedi from discovering who their true leader is and how they operate their power structure. And by the time they do figure it out, it's far too late. Their leader, Markeon Rowe, has an old and ancient feud with the Jedi that dates back through his family for the past 150 years. In fact, this ancient hatred for the Jedi led him on a path to discover an ancient weapon used by his ancestors to kill Jedi. A nameless horror called the Shri Karai, or the Leveler. Once Ro finds this beast, the game completely changes. The Leveler is able to make the Jedi experience immense fear, rendering them cut off from the Force before the beast consumes their energy and leaves them as a lifeless husk. I'm not going to go into much depth about Phase 2, unless you're interested. It is my favorite phase in this era, but it goes back in time 150 years to learn more about the Ro family and the Leveler. Phase 3 picks up a year after the fall of Starlight Beacon. The Jedi have all been recalled to Coruscant, away from their outposts in the galaxy, for fear of Markeon Rowe and the Leveler. The Jedi who are unable to come back are trapped in the occlusion zone, likely living in such a way as the Jedi survivors of Order 66. And so this is where my theory picks up. As the veil is starting to lift as to who the Nile are and what they want, a mysterious new figure will start to play a more open role in current events. Remember, Markeon Rowe is just a pirate who comes from an ancestral line of those who worship the Force in a strange and deformed way, but he is oddly connected to a web of informants in high places, scientists, corporations, politicians even. Though I believe no one is pulling his strings, I do believe he is unknowingly being nudged in the right direction by a Sith Lord. If you've read the Legends novels, Plagueis, or even the Bane trilogy, you remember that the Sith are playing the long game in their conquest. Instead of just playing power and mastery in the Force, their lethal methods of takeover revolve around political maneuvering and planting a cancer within the Republic. Everything the Nile is doing and all the division they are causing embodies everything that the Sith are wanting to accomplish right now. Shifting galactic power. Shifting the Jedi outlook and changing the way they approach their problems. Again, I show you the stone in my hand and you miss the knife at your throat. I keep thinking about the part in the Plagueis novel where he talks about a predecessor of his making a move that caused a great shift in the Force. Though this novel is not canon, I'm hoping that this is a canonized version of events playing out in the High Republic. You see, as fans, as readers, we know something that these characters don't know. We know that the Sith are around, 
and we know that they ultimately take their revenge. I predict that we will also find a definitive end to the High Republic in one single crucial moment that will be hidden from our characters. It will be sharp as a blade, and it will cut deep. In this story, the Sith Lord, who I suspect will be a side character from Phase 1 whom we've seen before, someone of political influence, who has been finding ways to get information to the Niles informant, will take interest in a particular character, someone to pass on the knowledge and training of the Sith in order to continue the line of Darth Bane. Who better to prey on? What better way to mark the end of the High Republic era, at least in the reader's eyes, than to defeat, seduce, and recruit the symbol of the era? The hero of Hetzel, the marshal of Starlight Beacon, the song of the force herself, Avar Chris. Think about it. Her incredible use of a variant of battle meditation allows her to use the force to connect the presence and thoughts of other Jedi, uniting them. The beginning of her story saw her become a hero not by fighting and wielding a lightsaber, but by using the force to connect and unify other Jedi. When she's promoted to Marshal of Starlight Beacon, she becomes battle-hardened and weary throughout her campaign of extinguishing the Dringir threat across the Outer Rim, going so far as defying the Jedi Council many times and forming an alliance with the Huts in order to destroy the Dringir. Her inability to help her fellow Jedi during the attack on Volo and the destruction of Starlight Beacon has brought about so much anger in her. She literally becomes obsessed and so focused on stopping the Nile that she plays right into their trap of chasing down the wrong person who is assumed to be the leader. She's willing to go so far as to kill Lorna D that Jedi Knight Keeve Trennis has to cross sabers with her in order to stop her. Small side note, Keeve Trennis will also leave the Jedi Order as we know that she is a member of the Lost 20. Back to Avar, she's already broken, already beaten. Again, I show you the stone in my hand you miss the knife at your throat. She goes from using the force to unite to using her lightsaber to attack first. Like the Joker says, madness is like gravity. All you need is a little push. If the Nile have driven her this angry, imagine the disillusionment, the frustration, and the anger of being trapped in the occlusion zone, always on the run, unable to help those in need. The song of the force is no longer able to flourish under its own rhythm but it's forced to make any deformed noise it can in order to drown out the wreck punk of the Nile, completely and utterly deformed. She'll do anything to stop the Nile and return harmony to the Force. Anything. We know that the Leveler feeds on the Force and brings about fear in the Jedi and those who are Force-sensitive. But how does that affect those in darkness who use fear as their ally? Perhaps the Sith Lord will meet Avar. Perhaps they will show her that using fear and power will stop the Nameless from harming her. With her friend, Elzar Man, on the other side of the occlusion zone, she has no one to keep her in the light. No one to tether onto. She comes to the realization that the only way to save the light is by submitting to the darkness. She will kill Mark Yonro. She will kill the Leveler. With the ease and the effortless motion that it took for her to stop Mark Yonro and the Leveler, she begins to realize something. The light was weak all along. The Jedi, so naive, so dogmatic, so weak, could not see the truth in front of them. The truth that the darkness is the only power worth knowing. The Force is not a song. The Force is a tool to bend, to use, to smash. And she would show them. Avar Chris would show the Jedi that it was their weakness that caused the galaxy harm for all these years. She would fake her own death, keep the Jedi off her scent. She would train with her new master, hidden, secluded, until the time was right to become the master herself, to manipulate this song to the one she wanted, to herald in the next Sith, and the next, and the next. She would be the maestro of this dark symphony until its ultimate crescendo, the ascension of the one whom her training would eventually culminate to, her grand creation, her own starlight beacon. She sees in a vision the Jedi dying, the temple burning, and the Sith Lord taking the song that she helped orchestrate and drop it like a hammer on the Republic. She smiles as she lifts her hood and vanishes into the galaxy with her new master, leaving her lightsaber and her most notable piece of jewelry, her diadem, in the dirt. Jedi Master Avar Chris proving that you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. As fans, we will know this as the definitive end of the High Republic. While the characters think that the Republic and the Jedi arose victorious and that this high era still persists, they've lost more than they realized. The Jedi will now become too subservient to the Republic. Outpost temples and wayseekers will be all but forgotten. Things will change to imitate what we know them to be in the prequels. The Jedi and the Republic will celebrate. The song will be at a triple forte, but little do they know, 
a low note, out of key, off harmony, hums under their notice. So what do you think? How would you end this phenomenal era of storytelling? Let me know in the comments. So until next time, take care, God bless you, and may the force be with you, always.